I'll be available. All right. Um, so last time uh, we were putting the mechanics back in, in quantum mechanics and talking about the quantum mechanical description of the dynamics of particles, which uh, our players now are position momentum. Those are the variables, and they have uh, we understand their connection uh, that's uni that unifies the classical and quantum description is that uh, momentum is the generator of spatial translations. It's the thing that's conserved if we have a spatially uh, translationally invariant system. And so from that, we can say that if we generate, because this is the generator, we, could, we wrote down a uh, near identity um, form of the translation operator uh, for a, a differential or very small translation as the identity and then a little bit generated by momentum. And so in, for a finite translation, that tells me that the translation operator is the, this uh, exponential of that anti-hermitian operator. And that translation operator acts as a unitary transformation that unitarily uh, acts to, um, to enact this translation position. Okay. Equivalently, what we said, the, the, this generator implies that it must be the case that positional momentum don't commute. And that commutator that follows is the canonical commutation equation. Okay? Now, I, I should mention that we can kind of turn this around and look at it, if we just look at it, if I just look at the uh, commutator in the other order, that what this tells me is that minus position is the generator of translations in momentum. So that uh, the exponential here with the position operator in the exponent acts as a translation on momentum. Okay. So positions the generator, or minus position is the generator of translation. Momentum, momentum is the generator of translation in position. Okay. All right. Given those operators, those permission operators, we can write down representations by uh, looking at bases. So the set of eigenvectors of position momentum are now represented uh, by eigenvalues that are continuous variables. They can take on any real value. And so, in that case, instead of a sum over discrete possible values of a vector, we have integrals over those uh, eigenvalues that form the resolutions of the identity. Okay? And uh, we can express then the representations of vectors in Hilbert space as now functions, complex functions, over the real line. So the re we now have, instead of a column vector in the representation, we have a function. And the function is a representation of the vector. Okay? And we have, in this case, two different representations, the position representation and the momentum representation. They are representations of the same state in two different bases, the position basis and the momentum basis. Okay? And this, since we have this continuum here, we don't, if we want to talk about a projection into some finite region, then this 
object represents a projection operator that projects the system into a differential region of the real line between x and x plus dx. So that's the projector in that slice of space. And so by the Born rule, what we know is that the probability uh, to find the particle in that region is the expected value of that projection. And that is given then here. So that then allows us to interpret psi star psi, or the magnitude squared of that wave function, that probability amplitude, as the probability density to find the particle at x. Okay. Um, I should say we also saw here that the action of the, the, the translation operator on x ket is to translate the ket, and I can normally say the translation by momentum on the momentum eigenvector is to translate the momentum. Right, so um, the states thus can uh, are generally in a Hilbert space, and we want those states to be normalizable. And with, we, so we, this inner product should be a finite number, and we typically set it to be one. And that we can express in the position representation or the momentum representation. And so this thus defines the set of allowed functions that define the Hilbert space. The allowed functions are the ones that when I integrate them, the square of them over the real line, they must be finite, and we, that finite number we just then set to one. So the space, the Hilbert space that we are discussing is the, the spine by the set of complex functions over the real line, which are square normalized. And that set forms a Hilbert space. That's really what Hilbert space is about. Hilbert space isn't about, in some sense, the, you know, two by two matrices. It's about this uncountably infinite set of functions and how they form an effective vector space with an effective dot product or inner product. All right? And that has a technical name. We call it L2 over R, square normalized. Um, the, we can look at, for example, now, so we have these representations, these wave functions. We can look at the, say, the, the representations and, say, position the momentum space of these eigenvectors. Okay? So, uh, for example, the position eigenvector, let's call it size of x naught, the position eigenvector at x naught. If I want to know what is the uh, wave function in, in position space associated with this ken, it's the inner product of this with x, right? But that is this, which is 0 unless x equals x naught, and it's infinity, actually, if x equals x naught. It's a Dirac delta function. All, or I could look at this guy in momentum space, the momentum space representation of a position eigenvector. We calculated this last time. That's given by this function, which is, of course, a plane wave. So if I were to look at, say, the, the magnitude of, this, of these representations, then a position eigenvector is a delta function localized at x naught. And but in momentum space, <coughs> that is completely delocalized everywhere in momentum. And this, of course, is not, this state is not a member of 
the Hilbert space. You can't ever prepare a system at a point. It would have an infinite spread of momentum. Of course, this is a reflection of the uncertainty principle. Okay. Of course, the opposite is true in momentum space. If I, if I had a momentum eigenvector, then a momentum eigenvector, if I ask what is it, its wave function, what is that? That's a plane wave. So if I'm in an eigenstate of momentum, that's a plus sign there, as a function of x, that's a plane wave. And we have this kind of pseudo-normalization. It's not really normalizable, but to keep it so that it has the delta function normalization, we have that factor there. So this is a plane wave. By the way, what is the wavelength of this plane wave? Usually we write a plane wave as e to the i k x. And the wavelength is, how is the wavelength related to k? 2 pi over k, thank you very much. Right. And in this case, uh, k is p naught over h bar, right, for this. That is to say, p naught is h bar k. And so the wavelength here uh, is 2 pi h bar uh, over p naught, or the Planck's constant. Or this, of course, is the de Broglie equation. That a particle with a certain momentum has an effective wavelength given by Planck's constant. about last time the uh, change of basis. So if I wanted to know, if I had the position representation, I wanted to get the momentum representation. Well, what I can do is a unitary transformation by inserting a resolution of the identity. Right? And this we just said was e to the minus i dx over h bar x. Or equivalently, if we want to go the other way around, I can insert a resolution of the identity with respect to the momentum basis. And this, of course, is nothing more than the Fourier transform. And as we discussed last time, we should think about the Fourier transform as effectively a change of basis. We're going from one basis, which is the position representation, to another basis, which is the momentum representation, or vice versa. And the change of basis Matrix is the representation of one basis vector in terms of the other. Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far? So far, so good. All right. So
So what we're talking about here, thus, is wave mechanics. So wave mechanics is the way in which we talk about uh, our quantum theory as described by wave functions. And we can think about those wave functions. Of course, Schrodinger developed this in the context of understanding what we knew about classical wave theory at first, but then we later understood this to be just a part of a, a more abstract theory of Hilbert space in which wave functions are just one representation of an arbitrary ket. Right? So let's see, what are our players here? Uh, um, so we have the position momentum representation. Wave functions. Now, we're in, if we were to talk, yeah? Well, why does a basic change uh, P go from tilt to have a non tilt at x small x to the Because that's a For example, uh, the inner product between two kets, then that has an equivalent in wave function language. How do you project one wave function onto another? Well, we know how to do that if we wanted to write it out by just inserting the resolution of the identity in X, and that is I take the complex conjugate of the function and I multiply it onto X, and that's equivalent to projecting phi onto psi. Okay? And that's what's going on here. If I wanted to find the momentum representation, what I do is I project my state onto the momentum eigenvector. And this is the momentum eigenvector represented in position space. And it's got the minus sign because it's the conjugate. And that's how you remember it. Because the plane wave is e to the i k x. And it's when you project, you take the complex conjugate. Now, of course, we, you know, if you have Frequency and time is the opposite of the whole thing about that for a moment. You can go to the minus sign when you get t instead of using anyway. Okay, so that's, that's that. Um, let me get my notes here to so make sure I remember everything I wanted to say. matrix elements. So suppose I have some observable A, and I want to write down that matrix element. Well, again, I can write this in the position representation by putting in resolutions of the identity. Okay. 
this is that. This is some function. And this is this. Now, what about those observables in position representation and momentum representation? We haven't talked about that. Let's do that. Let's talk about the position operator and momentum operator. in position representation. That's to say on wave functions. So, if I look at the position operator, what are its matrix elements with respect to x and x prime? Well, x on x prime is it's an eigenvector. So this is, or the other way around. That's its matrix element. But what that means is that when x operator acts on a state, and I want to know what is the new wave function after I've done this operator. Well, that's this, right? This is the new wave function, which is x, because this is an eigenvector. And of course, if it's Hermitian, it doesn't matter if I go to the left or the right. So it's just multiplication by x. In the position representation, the x operator acts like position on power is represented by x multiplying the wave function. What about the momentum operator? Well, that's true. If I look at the momentum operator, what is its representation between these two cats? Well, we don't know how momentum acts on this, right? We know how it acts on momentum eigenvectors. So the uh, way to deal with this is to insert a resolution of net entity. Right? I just did that right here. This is an eigenvector of a momentum operator. So this is Take this over here, 
is equal to um, 2 pi h bar over i, the derivative with respect to, say, x of e to the i p over h bar. Right? If I take the derivative of this with respect to x, it brings down an i h bar. I'm oh, sorry. So now I'm going to play a trick. The 
First of all, this is a derivative of the delta function. What the heck is the derivative of the delta function? The derivative of the delta function is this integral. That's what it is. And it has a particular, it only makes sense inside an integral. In the same way that only a delta function only makes sense inside an integral. It is a temporal distribution, as we call it. Now, the way I can do this is I can make, this is an odd function if I change x to minus, if I change x to x prime, there's a minus sign here. So I can make this minus the derivative with respect to x prime. That's equal to it. This, I just used the chain rule inside. This is x minus x prime. And now I do integration by parts. Do you know what integration by parts is? Integration by parts means throw the derivative on the other side. That's what integration by parts means. If the surface vanishes, let's just say if I have an integral from minus infinity to infinity of the derivative of f of x dx dx, this is equal to minus the derivative of f of x, the derivative on the other guy, if the integrand vanishes at the end points. Forget about your UDV, EDU, whatever you learned in Calc 1. Forget. This is integration by parts. Throw the derivative on the other side and put it on the next side. Okay? Try it. Um, so, integration by parts. Everyone should know it. So, in this case, I throw the derivative onto the other side and put a minus sign. So that says that this is equal to, so with a plus sign now, x prime, this is, should be dx prime, pardon me, that's my dummy variable, x prime. Delta x minus x prime, h bar over i, the partial x prime. And now, doing the integral, that says x equals x prime. So, in a very long-winded way, we derived what you know. The momentum operator in wave mechanics is the derivative with respect to x with this h bar. Right? So, uh, what this says is that in position space, the uh, action of the momentum operator in a state is represented by the derivative. Of course, we can do it the other way around. In momentum space, the momentum operator acts as multiplication by the momentum value. And the position operator acts as derivative, but with the other sign. Exactly the same way. So those are the representations of position momentum operators in wave function and in wave mechanics. Now, the fact that the momentum operator in position representation is the derivative should not surprise us. The reason it shouldn't surprise us is that momentum is the generator of translations in position. Okay. Suppose I have some function of position, and I translate it by a small amount of dx. 
Well, by Taylor's theorem, this is equal to the function of x plus dx times the derivative. In this case, it's one variable. What the heck? I'll just write it as a partial. It doesn't matter. It's only one variable. Anyway. That's Taylor's theorem. Right, and you f minus the or you should subtract it and divide by dx. That's the, derivative, the definition of the derivative, right? But look at what that is. Let's, for fun, um, let me multiply this by i over h bar. And then write this as Translates you in position by a little slope. So it's not a surprise that the derivative operator is uh, a uh, translation in, in that variable in position. And I'll leave it to you to show that this thing. which is the exponentiation of that, generates, makes the whole Taylor series. That is to say, this trick translates you by an arbitrary amount. The first order thing is dx, and then you have second derivatives, third derivatives, and that's the whole Taylor series. And this is the uh, Minus i x All right. Very good. So we have um, now in weight mechanics we have weight functions, we have inner products, we have matrix elements, we have representations of operators. Let's talk now about the Schroeder equation. So, the Schroeder equation, the time dependent Schroeder. Uh, h bar over minus i, the partial respect to t of psi, is the Hamiltonian of psi. Now, what's a Hamiltonian? If we're talking about particle mechanics, then the Hamiltonian is kinetic and potential energy. So the kinetic energy is p squared over 2m, and then we have the potential energy. So um, if I now write this in the this is my time-dependent state. This is in the Schrodinger picture, right? Uh, so I can write this formally and just shove in a ket there, shove in a ket there. This is thus the partial derivative respect to time of the wave function 
function of x and t. And then I have to have the uh, momentum representation, the momentum operator represented in x is the derivative with respect to x. So this becomes 1 over 2 m h bar over i squared, the partial squared plus b of x acting outside. Yes, sir. So, I mean, I don't think that, you know, notice that, like, you know, we just got off with side of t. Yeah. But there's no t operator that you can switch onto that to a generic no. side. Yes. It's already kind of like, kind of like that, or? So, this is a subtle point that I never really delved into. What is time? What is, how is, how, how do we treat time quantum mechanics? In non-relativistic quantum mechanics, time is just a parameter. It's not an observable. It's the parameter at which we ask, at this time, what is the probability for this out of the other thing? So it's, a, it's the arena, it's just a, it's a parameter. There is no Hermitian observable. We can't ask, what is the time of the particle? Time is about in non optimistic quantum mechanics is about us. At, at this particular instant of time, we ask a question, we do, we do a measurement. What is the position? What is the momentum? What is the state? So time is a parameter that parameterizes states in the Schrodinger picture, or it parameterizes observables in the Heisenberg picture. But it's not an observable. Now, there's something weird about that. Because, of course, in relativistic theory, space and time are interrelated. So what the heck? How can time and space have different roles? What happens in relativistic quantum mechanics? <coughs> Does time suddenly become an observable? And the answer is no. Position gets demoted. <laughs> <laughs> Position is no longer something talk about the position of a relativistic particle. Now we'll come back, I mean, in some sense we measure time, I mean we measure it poorly in this stupid lecture hall, but you know, so we have to, we'll come back to that question. What does it mean to measure time? But from the point of view of the mathematics here, time is not a eigenvalue of an observable, it's just a parameter. Very subtle. Okay, so this thus Let's talk just quickly. We can write down the results in 3D. Okay? In 3D, we have now position, which I'll call x to the vector. So this is x hat, y hat, z hat. And the momentum operator is, has an x operator, a y momentum operator. Okay. These are called vector operators. And we can have position eigenvectors which have vector numbers. So 
So these are the eigenvalues. There are the three eigenvalues, x, y, and z. And these satisfy the same kind of orthogonality relationship now with a three-dimensional delta function, which is another name for delta x minus x prime delta y minus y prime delta z minus z prime. Have resolutions of the identity, but now integrated over x, y, and z. And we can have wave functions as a function of three dimensional space, which are representations. And we can have normalizations. Now this is L2 and R3. And the action of the position operator on a vector in position space is multiplying by that position on the wave function. And what is the momentum operator in this case? How does it look in position representation? The gradient, right? This is h bar over i, the gradient. So in 3D, this is in one spatial dimension, in three spatial dimensions, this becomes h bar over minus i e by dt. The wave function in three spatial dimensions is minus h bar squared over 2 m, the Laplacian of psi plus v of x psi dt. We know I mean, it's a simple case we can solve it instantly, which you know, which is the free part. Uh, 
have a free particle. That means no forces. No external forces. That means the potential energy is zero. In that case, the Hamiltonian is just T squared with 2n. And the Schrodinger equation I rewrite it, it looks like this. So I set the potential equal to zero and just rewrote some stuff. Okay. What are the solutions of that equation? Well, there are lots of different solutions. By the way, this equation has a name. Do you know what this PD is called? It's the Helmholtz equation. It has lots of different kinds of solutions. But there's one solution we can write down instantly, which are plane wave solutions. How do we know that plane waves are a solution? Well, they're a solution, we can just plug them in. eigenstates of P are eigenstates of H, or at least there exists, as we know, uh, we can always construct common sets of eigenvectors if they commute. There exists common eigenvectors. Let me write it that way because it's a, it's a subtle point that I'm going to emphasize in a moment. There exists common complete or common sets of eigenvectors of the momentum operator and the Hamiltonian. Okay. So the momentum eigenvectors are these, and they are eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, too, with eigenvalue p squared over 2m, which is equivalent to saying that the wave vector, h bar k, is the eigenvalue. Or I could say yes. 
Now, I should note here that there is degeneracy. Why is there degeneracy? What set of different energy eigenvectors have the same energy eigenvalue? That's what it means to be degenerate. It means there are different vectors that have the same eigenvalue. Oh, are you asking? Or yeah, yeah, I'm asking. Oh, uh, but the same magnitude of momentum is exactly. directions? Exactly. Exactly. So the direction is irrelevant. It's only the magnitude that determines it. So any plane wave which has the same magnitude of the wave vector, so the energy eigenvalue, an eigenvector, if there is degeneracy, we need to specify a complete set of communion operators. So in 3D, we need three mutually commuting operators to fully specify the state. What are they? What are the ones that specify this as an eigenvector? Any suggestions? Do that. Can we use a B special like X, Y, Z? That sounds good. What X, Y, and Z? Uh, <laughs> position X, position Y, position Z? That doesn't commute. That's those are. But um, you're close. Um, P X, P Y, and P Z. They all commute with one another, and they all commute with the Hamiltonian. So that is, if we specify that, then the, the, the unique eigenvector, which is simultaneously an eigenstate, has the three eigenvalues. So the unique eigenvector, which is simultaneously eigenvector of those three operators. Well, that state is the state which has these three eigenvalues, which we lump together in the back. Okay. And these are the plane waves. That is to say, these vectors Our plane waves, and typically we normalize them with delta normalization. We will see next semester another set of three commuting operators. If I have, if 
h is only a function of the magnet, I'm sorry, if this thing is a rotationally symmetric potential, spherically symmetric potential, oh, sorry, we're talking about a free particle, never mind. And if for a free particle, I have another example, because that is rotationally symmetric. A Hamiltonian, the magnitude squared of the angular momentum and the z component. We will see that this is also, these three guys all commute with one another. You showed that in your first homework assignment or second homework assignment, right? That LZ commuted with P squared and L squared. So these three commute for a free particle. But they're not, they don't commute with momentum. So these are three different sets. And these things are, instead of plane waves, these are spherical waves. Spherical waves are also solutions to the Helmholtz equation. But they're not plane waves, and they're not eigenstates of momentum. They're eigenstates of this stuff. And these things have a name also, they're also called partial waves. And they're very important in the theory of scattering. We'll talk about that next semester. So just because it's a free particle doesn't mean it's in a plane wave. If it's an eigenstate of energy, it could be a superposition of different plane waves, all of which have the same length of the vector but different directions. Any superposition of that sort is also an energy essence state because you have degeneracy. And the superposition of degenerate vectors has the same energy eigenvalue. So that's a free particle. This is a plane wave. Right? 
right? Now, um, notice the relationship here between uh, frequency and wavelength is known as the dispersion relation. So E equals the energy relation using the wave particle duality. Tells me that omega as a function of k is h r k. That's the dispersion relation. For a free particle. And given the dispersion relation, we can talk about phase and group velocities. Okay. So the phase velocity How is that defined? Remember that? Those of you who took 406 with me, I have this in chance. Omega over K? Omega over K. Right? Wave theory. And so that's equal to h bar a over, or h. Should the k in that dispersion relation? Yeah, 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 that's, thank you, sorry. That's why that screwed up. That went weird. That's right. And the group velocity is what? Thank you. depends on the wavelength. Okay, here it is. Which means that different waves of different wavelengths move at different phase velocities, which means the wave disperses. That's why it's called a dispersion relation. Okay, now I ask you a question because this always confuses people when people forget. The, if I have an electromagnetic wave in free space in the vacuum, does it disperse in the vacuum? No, because it's the speed of light, all frequency. It's only when you're in a medium. Whereas an electron, if I thought about it as a wave, an atmospheric wave in the vacuum, it disperses because it has mass. That's to do with the difference between the dispersion relation. This is the non-relativistic. Right? For, for a photon, it's E equals PC. That's a linear relationship between omega and K. That's why this doesn't disperse, but this does. for the time-dependent Hilbert equation in free space. 
for a free park. So I'm given this, which is to say I'm given a wave function at time t equals zero. And I seek the wave function at some later time. This is not necessarily an energy eigenstate. It's some arbitrary part of state. And I want to know what is the solution. How do I solve the time dependent Schroeder equation? Well, a generic procedure is the following take the initial state, decompose it into energy eigenvectors. You know how every energy eigenvector evolves, and then resum them. Right? So my initial uh, state at time equals zero can be expanded in terms of energy eigenvalues. In this case, the energy eigenvalues are continuum of energies. Energy goes from zero to infinity, where the energy is given by that. Uh, um, times that. I'll call this thing uh, C sub D. And so my state at, la at, at any later time is just So 
what have we done here? What we say here is that, and I can write, this is really just another name for the momentum space wave function at x equals zero. If I know what the momentum space wave function at times equals zero, then I know it, what the wave function is at any time because every one of these guys just gets a phase. If they're at times equals zero, these of course are equal, right? This is just the inverse Fourier transform. But at a later time, well, each momentum component picks up this phase factor. And this will generally lead to dispersion of a wave packet, also known as the spreading of the spreading of a wave packet. So if I start with a localized wave packet in position, because it has a spreading momentum, and because each momentum has a different phase velocity, the different momenta get out of step with one another and the wave function will spread. And we'll review this in homework for your next assignment. All right? So, you're back to the future. We're back to wave mechanics. We'll you. And it's all connected.